In this section, we're going to talk about external flow over a flat plate. So if you're reading along in chapter six and seven, you'll see that there are some complex derivations for relationships that we're going to give a very brief overview of, but we will talk about where those relationships came from in general. While there are some mathematically derived relationships, they're, like there exists for flow over flat plates, they're very complex, even for simple geometries. And in fact, most solutions are experimentally derived. But what we will see is that there, the formula for the average Neusselt number for a, a given geometry is often represented by this form with relative accuracy. C is a constant that'll depend on the geometry and the flow conditions. RE subscript L is the Reynolds number raised to some exponent M. The Prandtl number, which as you recall, is the ratio of viscous effects, effects to thermal effects will be raised to some exponent n. You know that the Ran Reynolds number and the Prandtl number are going to depend on the fluid properties, which are going to vary with temperature and thus position across, across the boundary layer. And so to account for this variation, properties are usually evaluated at the film temperature, TF, or an average temperature, and in this way are assumed to remain constant over the entire flow. From the last video, it's obvious that the velocity and temperature distributions are related to one another, but we don't have a great mathematical relationship for that yet. So let's start with the velocity boundary layer description. We're going to apply two of our conservation equations to the boundary layer, the conservation of mass and the conservation of momentum. Um, keep in mind that the solutions that we'll look at right now are only applicable for incompressible laminar flow over a flat plate. The conservation of mass says that the rate of mass coming in equals the rate of mass going out if the process occurs at steady state, which is what's going on here. So we have a control volume with dimensions dx, dy, dz, um, and the rate of mass going into the control volume on the left hand side at x is the density times the velocity times the cross-sectional area through which the mass flows. We do the same thing for the mass going into the bottom face. Now we look at the mass flowing out at x plus dx. Um, and if you recall, we can express the velocity in the x direction at x plus dx like this. Um, Rewatch video uh, 2.3 if you need a refresher on why this is. We also have mass going out at y plus dy. Then we can say that we're only considering velocity in the x and the y direction, not the z direction. So for this two dimensional problem, t dz is just one. And dividing through by the density and simplifying, we get this equation. Now let's talk about the conservation of momentum. But since we're talking about parallel flow over a flat plate, we'll only consider the conservation of momentum in the x direction. Conservation of momentum says that the sum of the forces in the x direction is equal to the force due to pressure plus the force due to viscous effects, i.e. the resistance to flow. Those are the shear stresses that you see on the top and the bottom in the diagram here. Because shear stress is defined in terms of viscosity, you can see how what you see in the diagram is related to the equation. The pressure gradient in the x direction is negligible for flow over a plat flat plate, so that comes out in the, of the equation. There is another term in the equation which is not listed here, and that's force due to body forces. So that would be forces due to gravity, which are ignored here for a forced convection analysis, but end up being very important in free convection. So we have our conservation of mass and our conservation of momentum, two differential equations that have velocity gradients in the x and the y direction. How can we simultaneously solve for this? Not easily. Well, Prandtl, whom the Prandtl number was named for, was a professor and his student was Blasius. So Prandtl asked Blasius to solve this problem in 1908. Prandtl defined a stream function, then he defined a similarity variable. This allowed him to combine those two partial differential equations into a single third order differential equation. And Prandtl thought that this mathematically improved the situation, although it doesn't look that improved to us uh, most likely. He looked uh, at, he then looked at that third order partial differential equation. And because he had already defined the velocity component in the x direction with respect to the free stream velocity, he was able to define some of the parameters where the velocity u was 99% that of the free stream velocity. In other words, at the y location of the boundary layer thickness. 
So skipping over the details um, and just appreciating the Blasius solution for the genius that it was, we could see that he broke it all down to the definition of the boundary layer thickness to be five times X times the square root of the Reynolds number. Um, keep in mind that, the, that Blasius derived this for laminar flow and it doesn't apply for turbulent flow. He was able to use the same solution to calculate the local shear stress. The second derivative of F with respect to his similarity value evaluated at y equals zero gives us 0 0.332. And then plugging that into our equation for the local shear stress and using Blasius' solution, we get an equation that looks much simpler. And of course, we can relate that to the shear stress, uh, relate the shear stress to the local friction coefficient. And that brings us to the next equation on our equation sheet. We can also relate the local friction coefficient to the average friction coefficient taken from the leading edge to some location x. So if you want uh, the, average, uh, the average from 0 to L, you're just going to be integrating from 0 to L and then dividing everything by L. So here's our, here's our local friction coefficient defined in terms of the Reynolds number. I have the definition of my Reynolds number right here. And if I integrate with respect to x, you can see that I eventually get a final solution that looks similar, uh, but I just have 1.328 uh, instead of 0 0.664. And that brings me to the next equation on my equation sheet. Now let's look at the conservation of energy. So before we get go any further, let's just look at our equation. If the process is occurring at steady state, the rate of energy going in equals the rate of energy going out. The first two terms represent the energy entering the system by mass. The second term represents the rate of energy entering the control volume by heat transfer. That term should look sort of like your heat diffusion equation, except we don't have significant temperature gradient in the x direction, so we only see the second derivative of the temperature with respect to y. The last term represents the energy transfer into the system by viscous forces. That would be if the fluid was very viscous and as the fluid molecules flow past one another, the friction between them will cause the fluid to heat up. Typically, this will be a negligible effect, but for high speed flows or the flows of very viscous fluids, it may be important. So the conservation of energy is used to relate the temperature profile to the velocity profile using a similarity variable that Blasius used. For our purposes, we're just really interested in the solution, which gives us a, the Nusselt number as a function of the Reynolds number and the Prandtl number. Uh, note that this is valid for Prandtl numbers larger than 0.6. If your Prandtl number is very small, like it is for liquid metals, there's another relationship that you should use. That same similarity value solution leads us to the conclusion that for laminar flow, the ratio of the velocity boundary layer to the thermal boundary layer is the Prandtl number raised to the one third. So now let's look at the average Nusselt number for laminar flow over a flat plate. The average Nusselt number is related to the average heat transfer coefficient, h. And we know that we need to integrate the local convective heat transfer coefficient over the plate to solve for the average heat transfer coefficient. That local h value is also related to the local Nusselt number. So we start with the local uh, Nusselt number for laminar flow if the Prandtl number is larger than 0.6, and we plug that into the integral. We see a Reynolds number and we define it in terms of x so that we can integrate it, integrate that big long equation with respect to x. A lot of things come out of the integral and we see that all we really need to integrate is x raised to the negative one half. Um, and integrating that, in this case, from x equals zero to x equals l, we get our average heat transfer uh, coefficient and we can combine the density, viscosity, U infinity, and L terms to get things in terms of that Reynolds number. And plugging that into our equation for the average Nusselt number, we get our final heat transfer correlation for laminar external flow on our equation sheet. All right, so we have a few local parameters uh, for turbulent flow uh, for the local uh, friction coefficient, the relationship of the velocity and thermal boundary layers in, term in, in turbulent flow, and the local Nusselt number. Um, they've, they've, they haven't been in, obtained analytically, but by experimentation. 
Um, and just keep in mind that these are local parameters um, at specific locations in the regions of turbulent flow. But we need to be really careful about when we're talking about average values. So if you're going to be talking about the average values, you need to keep in mind that there's going to be a region of uh, a region of of laminar flow before that turbulent region. In other words, you're going to have mixed flow. So you need to integrate over the laminar and turbulent regions to get the equation for the average heat transfer coefficient over the entire plate. You have equations for the local Nusselt number for laminar and turbulent flow. And if you integrate those laminar and turbulent regions and then relate the average Nusselt number to the um, average heat transfer coefficient, you get the equation uh, for the average Nusselt number for mixed flow. Um, and you can apply a similar strategy to get the average friction coefficient for mixed flow over a flat plate. We could trip the flow at the leading edge using a fine wire or some other turbulence promoter and cause turbulence over the entire plate. And in such a case, there would be no mixed flow. So to find the average heat transfer coefficient over the plate, we have to integrate over over the plate, um, but we but we have to we only have to integrate using the local H value here, which is for turbulent flow, and we can get that in terms of the local Nusselt number, and then we just use the local Nusselt number here. So as you can see, there are a lot of equations, but you'll have to you'll have to you'll have all those equations on your equation sheet, and your job is just to figure out which one to use. Um, also keep in mind that, that all the equations that we used involve flow over a flat plate only. So when you're solving convection problems, figure out whether or not that you've transfer, uh, whether or not you've transitioned to turbulent flow or not. When you're solving convection problems, um, you need to get your Reynolds number, see if that critical Reynolds number of 500,000 has been reached at the location that you're interested in. Um, Next, figure out if you need an average value or a local value. value. Um, presumably, you'll be after your H value, so you need to get your Nusselt number, and then from there, you can calculate your H value. Well, I hope that was helpful. Thank you for watching. Let me know if you have any questions.